Uh, good morning and good morning to those who are watching online today. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer and we will get to Acts 17. Uh, Father and God, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness and grace as always. And thank you for your love and mercy. And Lord, we lift up those who are ill today, <coughs> those who may be traveling, uh, those who uh, have a busy weekend, a long weekend. And just pray, Lord, for uh, your work in our hearts today. For those here, for those watching as well. And that you be honored and glorified and help us, Lord, to, to seek you and to see you for who you are. Uh, help us to trust you in everything, Lord. And may you guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in uh, the book of Acts. So we'll get to Acts 17 here in just a second. just want to kind of give you the, uh, the context of where we were. Uh, get back to this here in just a moment. But again, uh, the book of Acts takes place over about 32 years, just as a quick reminder. Uh, throughout the... Early chapters, we see the focus on Peter, who was the main individual uh, doing the teaching, the outreach, Pentecost, and things like that, uh, because he was given the keys to the kingdom, and it was his responsibility for uh, these things to take place. So he had to be there for each of these steps taking place, particularly when it comes to chapter 10 and uh, Cornelius, Gentile. And uh, he, Peter was there and, of course, opened the uh, understanding and shared uh, history and shared about Christ, and of course Cornelius and his family became believers. Then we're introduced to a guy named uh, Saul, who became Paul, and he did his first mission trip in chapters 13 and 14, and we're kind of in the middle of his second missionary trip here in chapter 17. Now just as a quick review in chapter 16, um, there was a, a lot of traveling that took place. Uh, Paul and Silas went to prison, the Philippian jailer was uh, converted, and just as a way of reminder, uh, here is the original time. I know it's kind of hard to see there on the camera. But over here is what we would call Turkey today. You can see down here, Turkey, Asia Minor, Galatia is there, uh, Pamphylia, Cilicia, Syria is over here, Antioch, which is the main sending church uh, in the, that became in the book of Acts. Uh, they became the, the main sending church there in the book of Acts. Uh, and that was the center of the hub. Of course, Jerusalem was down here. And Paul, on his second missionary trip, you know, traveled this way, and he was up in Philippi, which is what we just read. And then he went to Thessalonica in chapter 17, and that is just over here, right there. Again, roughly 35, 40 miles. Now, we'll go ahead and read verses 1 through 9 of 17, just by way of review. And then get into the rest of the text. So chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now again, they went to Thessalonica, went to the synagogue, that was his custom. You see that all the time <coughs> within the book of Acts. And he used the Scriptures, of course. And again, just to highlight the verbs, reasoned, explained, improved, or proving. All these are action words. So he is using Scripture to explain, to give a systematic approach to saying, you know, this Jesus whom was crucified is the Messiah. He is the promised one who was to come. Verse 4, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, uh, as did a great many devout Greeks, you know, Gentiles, not a few of the leading women. So we have many of the Jews who believed. Uh, and of course, the Greeks, who would have been God-fearers or proselytes, who would have heard about Messiah to come, at least to some extent, you know, they, they, they trusted as well, and then a few leading women. But then there were some of the Judeans or Jews uh, within that group that did not believe, like in verse 5, but, but the Jews were jealous, or the Judeans were jealous, uh, taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out by, to the crowd. So just as we're, again, saying the context here, these unbelieving individuals went to the rabble. Now, just as a reminder, what's a rabble? You know, we don't use that word very much. What's a rabble? Yeah, lowlifes. They went to the lowlifes. They went to the, uh, the area where the thugs hung out. <laughs> Those individuals who would do anything for money. And as, as we talked about last time, you know, some things never change. 
you know, those who are willing to compromise, those who are willing to say anything or do anything, whether it's true or not, for money. You know, again, this was the, the Antifa of the day, to put it in our terminology. Yes, exactly. Or the corrupt politicians, which there are many. And these individuals from the rabble formed a mob. <laughs> again, we see parallels to our world today. And they basically stormed the house of Jason, which is where Paul and Silas and others were staying. Uh, and they wanted to bring them out to the crowd. Uh, and when they could not find them, verse 6, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities saying, shout, or shouting, These men have turned the world upside down and have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason... And the rest, they let them go. So, again, there's this mob that goes to this house of Jason, where apparently Paul, Silas, and others were previously staying. Now, where they were now, we don't know. We're not told. But they drug out Jason and drug out some of the other brothers. They brought them to the, to the authorities. These men are doing things that are unlawful. Now, how much this mob actually knew, we're not told. Remember, these were hired individuals that were being paid. I know, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Hmm, some things never change. So they go to Jason's house, and, and, and now, as I mentioned last time, just as a quick, quick review, this used to bother me that they gave them money, but this was like a security deposit, uh, like a promise, and you know, we, won't, we won't cause trouble, things like that. Now, I do think this kind of caused some issues for Paul later on, why he wasn't able to come back to Thessalonica, uh, but that's, that's another, another discussion. That's kind of the situation here. So it brings us to verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Uh, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Well, how do, they, how do we know that? Well, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek, Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews of the Judeans of the Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul to Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Verse 14. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way by the sea to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul uh, brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him, as soon as possible they departed. So, they left Thessalonica and came down to Berea. So here again, roughly 35, 40 miles, came down here. To Berea, again, Paul went to the, the synagogue. But how are these Jews different at this synagogue? Luke says they were more noble. That's a pretty complimentary term. And rightly so. Why is that? What does he say that they did? There in verse 11. They received the word with eagerness. They were ready, willing, and wanting to hear the scriptures taught. So these individuals, they were... They were hungry for the word. Also, too, they were not gullible. They examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So Paul gets up, starts talking about Isaiah 53, for example. What do they do? They go to Isaiah 53 to see what he's talking about. They go to the text to double-check the Apostle Paul. They were not foolish. Uh, they were discerning. But they wanted to see it for themselves. So they, they did that. And of course, many of them therefore believed. Now there's a lot when it comes to receiving the word with eagerness, examining. I mean, these guys were ready to hear. They were ready to listen. When they came to a service, they were ready to worship God, we would say in our, our vernacular today. They wanted to hear the word of God preached. And they, they really were hungering, like I said, for what Scripture or truth was. And then when Paul comes along and says, hey, 
the Messiah has come. Here's the evidence. And he points to the Old Testament scriptures. He's right. Messiah has come. We believe. Whoa. That's powerful. So it says, many of them believed. Not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So there was a multitude of individuals in this Jewish synagogue here in Berea that were now following the Messiah. But a problem arose. The individuals or the Jews from Thessalonica, which again, 30, 40 miles away, <laughs> they heard the word of God was preached. Well, how do they know? We're not told. Maybe some passerby was there, near there, you know, on his way up to Thessalonica. He says, well, you know, I heard this amazing message at the synagogue. Let me tell you guys about it. Maybe some of the individuals who were there went up to Thessalonica to visit. Who knows? We're not sure. We're not told. But then the leadership from Thessalonica sent people down to Berea. <laughs> And they caused a, a commotion there. They agitated. They stirred up the crowds. And we see why this transition is taking place between law to grace. We see what Paul said in chapter 13, that you who consider yourself not worthy were going to the Gentiles. So we see this, this pattern repeated over and over again, even though Paul still went to the Jews first. So they sent Paul, they sent uh, uh, away, and they, they took him as far as Athens. Now, where is Athens? Athens is down here. Greece, here's Mount Olympus right there. Athens is down here. Now, it says they sent him by sea, so they probably uh, left the port right here near Berea and went down here to Athens, which would be much faster because it's on, the, on, on that little outlet or inlet there. Now, I've never been to Athens. I would love to go. Um, there is a lot of history in Athens, of course, you know, the you know, Greek the, uh, philosophy and the theologians there in, in Greece, you know, not, even though it really wasn't theology, but uh, philosophy and uh, Aristotle, Plato, and uh, the Greek gods. You guys ever study mythology at all? A little bit fascinating stuff. It actually kind of grotesque as well what some of the supposed gods did. I mean, if you look at some of the, the Clash of the Titans films or something like that, or some of the uh, documentaries, you know, on, on Greece, you, know, you get a, kind of an idea. Uh, but it's actually pretty interesting when you look at it <coughs> and it shows the perversion of humanity. It really does. But Paul was in Athens. So what does he do? He walks around. You know, when you guys go to a new place, what do you do? Walk around. You go to a theme park, you walk around. You go to someplace new, you walk around. You, know, you go on vacation to a, someplace you've never been before. What do you do? You walk around. That's what Paul does. He does what is normally happens. So let's look at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that is, uh, Timothy and Silas at Athens, his spirit was provoked in him when he saw the city was full of idols. Now, that is not an understatement. There, there is a, a quote from an ancient historian that says that there were more gods in Athens than men. And when you look at where all of these gods and goddesses would have been, you know, engraved into buildings and walls and uh, their own temples uh, above door, you know, door entrances and things like that. I mean, there was a, a plethora of idol idols and idolatry in Athens along with a lot of sexual immorality, too, historically, as well. So, what was Paul's response? Was he like, eh, let them worship their own gods in their own way? No. It says, his spirit was provoked within him. He became angry. He became impassioned. He became concerned. He said, I have to do something about this. I have to say something. Let's keep going. Verse 17. 
So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Now remember, he's waiting. He doesn't know how long he's going to have to wait. They would meet in the synagogue every day because it wasn't just a religious service. This was the, the hub of Jewish activity and community and business in the synagogue. So he was there. He also reasoned with them just as he did in Berea. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, who does this babbler wish to say? Or what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities or foreign gods. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now a little bit of a context here. There's two different groups that Paul talks to here in Athens. And it's really crucial to see the distinctions. He talks to the Jews in the synagogue. He witnesses to them one way. He goes to the scriptures. Again, he goes to the Old Testament, the fulfillments of, you know, of, of the prophecies and a whole bunch of other things that would uh, take, be discussed rather uh, when it comes to this kind of topic. But when he talks to the Epicureans and Stoics, he uses another approach, which we'll get to. Um, we'll probably start, start in that today and then finish that up next week. But here we have, again, Paul, who had not planned to do any ministry in Athens. This was not a pre-planned thing. There was some issues in Thessalonica and then Berea. <coughs> so he had to leave. And in God's providence, he ends up in Athens. He goes to the synagogue, talks to them. And somehow some of these Epicureans and Stoic philosophers hear about this. Maybe they were at the synagogue. Maybe they were curious. What do these Jews really believe? And they just so happen to be there <laughs> when Paul comes and starts preaching Christ and the resurrection. Now, the Epicureans and Stoics, these were two camps of philosophy in that day. There were different beliefs in different groups. Uh, the Epicureans um, had their own you know, set of beliefs and gods and goddesses and the involvement and things like that. Uh, the Stoics were, were different. Uh, you could say the Stoics were similar to like Vulcans. You know, the, the, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know, the way to overcome emotion was to you know, use logic, use reason. Uh, the Epicureans were a little bit more, uh, hey, let's party on, you know, you know, the more Bill and Ted kind of thing, you know, for, for those of us who understand that uh, analogy there. You know, they, they, they enjoyed indulgence. You know, so again, there's two different philosophical camps here uh, that Paul has to address. But they were both actually evolutionists in their own way. That's kind of an interesting thing, and Paul will deal with that. So they did not believe in God's involvement in humanity. You know, one believed in fate. You know, God's not going to come down and be involved in our lives. What's, what kind of nonsense is that? And then you're talking about this Jesus, God in human flesh, who died and resurrected, came back to life. Now, this is fascinating, just as a pause. Within Greek theology, within Greek philosophy, they had the concept of God's dying and coming back to life. But this was completely different to them. So when they say, well, you know, the New Testament's based upon Greek mythology, and that's not what these Greek philosophers said. They were, they were saying, you're preaching a foreign divinity because you're preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Completely different than their own ideas and understanding about resurrection. So they, who is the they, that is the Epicureans and Stoics, took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying this, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who had lived there <laughs> would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So in other words, hey, come over here. We, we want to hear more about this. Uh, what is this you're preaching at the Areopagus, the main area near where the Parthenon is? You know, this, this, is, this is Mars Hill. You know, the Parthenon will be up here. Mars Hill is right across there. You can, you can see it. And the Parthenon, of course, is, you know, one of the, the main structures in Athens to the false gods, among others, too. And here these guys are like, wow, this is really interesting. 
So they took him to the coffee shop of that day. And, hey, let's, let's, let's go have some coffee. Let's talk about these new things that are new to our ears. Now, I like to note that Luke wrote here that the Athenians and Forders who lived there, all they did was talk about something new. They philosophized. <laughs> but we also need to recognize that the glory of Greece had passed. Rome was now the power. Greece is, you know, uh, afterthought. Although Rome, you know, took the gods of Greece and changed the names. <laughs> but here we have, you know, still the, the, the apex of philosophy was still in Athens in many ways. Now, Rome, of course, was critical as well. You know, of course, Rome was over here. But, you know, Athens was still a powerhouse when it comes to philosophical thought. So Paul is here, and he goes up. He goes up on the Areopagus. Verse 22, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found that this altar with an inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown or in ignorance, is another way to put that, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Let's stop there. So here he is in Athens at the Areopagus, Mars Hill. And you can go there and actually see a plaque. You can look it up online of the, the message that Paul had here in Acts 17. There's a plaque that's in, embedded in the stone. Now the message that we have written here is probably a summary of what Paul said. Because you can read it in a couple minutes. But when you talk to philosophers, you can't talk to them in a couple minutes. That doesn't happen. Because they're asking questions, and what about this? Well, I have heard this said, you know, kind of thing. And they, they go back and forth and discuss these things. And, of course, Paul would have been able to do that very, very well. But think about what this is. He's, he's here in a completely Gentile or Greek worldview setting. I've taught through the book of Acts a few times, it's, it's, or rather the, the chapter 17 a few times, and it's really astounding the approach that Paul takes, different with the Jews than the Gentiles. Where does Paul start? With these Greeks, with these philosophers. Where does he begin? In the beginning. In the beginning, he says, you know, as I, first of all, as I passed by, I saw this altar to an unknown God. Now, remember, they had altars for every God, but they wanted one just in case they missed another God. They didn't want to offend that God or goddess. And there are actually more than one of those. And you can look up online. They have found these stone uh, altars, and it says to an unknown God on it. You know, they're, you know, probably yay big and, you know, again, carved and, you know, little fancy you know, designs and stuff. But he passed by and he used that as a connection, as a bridge to share with them the truth. And this is something we can do today. You know, when we're trying to witness to somebody, find that connection, find that bridge to share the gospel. It could be family, it could be work, uh, it could be a struggle, it could be a problem, it could be current events, whatever the case is. One time, I think I've told you guys this before, I was doing a video shoot in Pennsylvania. I think it was in either Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. I can't remember which. And I was having lunch. And I saw this, this woman over in the corner bowing her head before she ate. I was like, oh, okay, interesting. I wanted to talk to her. I was like, but what do I say? How do I say it? Hmm. I, I just asked a question. Who'd you pray to? And I found out that she prayed to a God different than the Bible. So I was able to talk to her. You know, but that's using something that's right there as a bridge to connect and share the gospel. And that's something that we can do too. And that's what Paul does. And he begins in the beginning. Remember, these philosophers do not believe that there's a point in time where things were created. Their evolutionary ideas are contrary to that. But Paul starts here in the beginning. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men. So he actually goes through, and as you study this, you'll find that God, or Paul, talks about the character of God. He's a creator. This God who I'm proclaiming to you 
that you're worshiping in ignorance, that you say is unknown, that you do not know about, is the one that I'm going to tell you about. He is Lord of heaven and earth. So these false gods that you're worshiping, this philosophy that you think is so important, it's under his authority. He is the one who's the ruler. He is the one who is Lord or master. Not these idols which you have around here, and certainly not the temples to which you go to. He cannot be contained within a temple. Who would want a God that could live in a box? Think about that. But there are millions, if not billions of people around the world that still worship a God in a box. And I'm not talking about your cell phone. <laughs> it's a different one. No, I, I can't remember where it was, but I heard somebody, uh, a Christian, was flying on a plane. Uh, and there was uh, somebody in the seat next to him uh, with a suitcase. And the person opened up the suitcase or the, you know, the briefcase or whatever it was, and, and I, I may get some of the details mixed up, but I think they picked out their gods from their briefcase. And that was a bridge. So you carry your gods around? My God carries me around. Let's talk about the difference. I mean, why would you want a God you can put in a suitcase? Think about that. But again, there's millions of people who do, and they're very sincere about it too. You know, we need to recognize that... You, even though they are sincere, they're sincerely wrong. And they need Jesus. And Paul understood this, which is why he was doing this, why he was saying these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And in, in the Old Testament, it talks about that. Yeah, you know, we, we create gods based upon our needs and wants that looks like us or acts like us to justify us rather than submitting to the God who is the only one who can justify us in Christ. That's a very good point. So the God who made the world, he's Lord of heaven and earth, is not, does not live in temples made by man. Verse 25, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now this is critical to understand too historically, because in the context, particularly in Athens and Rome and, and things like that, you had to bring food to the gods as an offering, the temples. And even to this day, in places in India and China and Taiwan, they bring things to their gods. Why? So their gods can eat. To, they were, in, the, in the, the Greek thought, in Greek mythology, the gods were dependent upon the offerings made by man, in one sense. So Paul here says, first of all, the creator God is not limited by the temples made by man, nor is he sustained by these offerings that are brought to him. He doesn't need this. He owns it all. He is over all. And because he is over all, he gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything needed to live. That's called common grace in theological terms. The sun rises, the sun sets, the rains, crops grow. And you sow the seeds as a, as a uh, farmer. You don't have to be a follower of God for it to grow. It's natural law. But God's still over that. He provides that for people. You go to other countries, you know what? There's trees there. <laughs> Unless you're in a desert, you know. You know, there's shrubbery there. You know, there's crops there. You go to Japan, they have rice fields all over the place because that's part of their food. So God provides these things. Verse 26, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allocated periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. Whoa. So not only is God the creator, he's a sustainer too. He provides for everything for mankind. And he made from one man every nation. Now, who is this man that Paul's talking about? Where does Paul go back to? Who is the one man we're all descended from? Adam. Adam. Yeah. 
Adam. <laughs> Maybe you need another cup of coffee. <laughs> So he goes back to Adam and he doesn't name him. Why doesn't he name him? Because they wouldn't have a clue who he was talking about. So he says, you know, God's a creator. We all descended from one man, Adam. And God has set the boundaries where we were going to live and dwell. Well, what was the purpose for that? Look at verse 27. We'll finish up here. That they, that's humanity, should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Let's read verse 28 too. In him, for in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So, Paul says God is a creator, he's a sustainer, but he also has put you in a place so that you would seek after him. Not these false gods which you've grown up with, not the false gods which you know about and believe in, but that you would see his creation and seek him. And find him. And as you look at scripture, as you look at history, there are individuals outside of a Christian context who understand there has to be a God who made all these things. Yet he's actually, I like this, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. He's omnipresent. And when we understand, hey, wait a second, there is a God out there who is a creator it's not the God of the sky or the mountain or the river or the water or the birds or the fish or whatever. There has to be a God over all these things. And I wonder who he is. Again, when you read missionary biographies and things like that, you hear stories like this. You know, how, why, why didn't you come to us sooner? <laughs> is sometimes the question that are asked by the natives. And then he quotes actually from two Greek poets. I've got a note here. And this one's probably from Epimenides of Crete and Aratus' poem, that's right, Phenomena. And the first and the second one. So Paul, being a very educated man, quotes from two of their Greek poets whom they would be familiar with. Now, these, this is a quote, he's not saying that what they wrote was inspired, but he's saying, you know what, the principles that I'm talking about, you guys are already aware of. This is a God I'm preaching and proclaiming to you that in him we live and move and have our being. That is, it is under his authority, under the umbrella of who he is and what he has done and created that we live. For we are indeed his offspring. That is, we are his creation. We are the product of his hand. So again, he's using what they are familiar with as a bridge to get to the point of talking about Christ ultimately, which you'll get to. Now, again, this is probably a summary, like I said. You know, so there's probably a, a lot of things that we don't have written down that he said and discussed. But this is quite fascinating. We'll stop right there. You know, and this is by way of application for us. Are we like the Bereans? Whenever we come to a Bible study or a church service or our own devotionals or whatever it is, turn the radio on, listen to Christian music or teaching or preaching or a conference, whatever it is, are we eager to hear the word of God? Also, too, are we gullible or are we discerning? Do we just believe because somebody tells us something? Not just theologically, but even in our world today. I mean, we need to really be discerning today. Do we go to the scriptures to search? <clears throat> Do we say, okay, that sounds really interesting, <clears throat> Let me go to the Bible and see what it says. What does the Bible say? And what does the Bible mean? And then, of course, based upon what the Scripture says, not necessarily what someone tells us, do we base our beliefs upon the truth of the Word of God? So we need to be like these noble Bereans. Also, too, when it comes to witnessing to someone, and I would encourage us all to share the gospel, of course, don't think that one plan fits all. 
it doesn't work. Now it's good to have the Romans road, the, the um, other you know different kinds of things. You know, if you want to use tracks, you can use tracks. That's a great way to do it. Uh, the the way of the master again also very helpful, very great. But we have to recognize that whenever we talk to somebody, we're talking to a person. They have their own struggles, their own needs, their own questions, their own background, their own baggage. You know, maybe this individual was in a a church where they got hurt very deeply. You know, maybe he or she committed a sin and was repentant, but they were shunned by other people rather than embraced and forgiven. You know, maybe there was a problem with the church leadership. Maybe they found out that all the deacons were corrupt and were stealing money from the church. Well, wait a second. Or maybe it's the son or daughter of a pastor who has the Bible, quote-unquote, shoved down their throats their entire life. And they reject it because they don't want to hear it. Or they see the hypocrisy at home of a Christian. You go to church on Sundays, but you act a completely, different, completely differently the other days of the week. If that's what Christianity is, I don't want any part of it. So when we share the gospel with somebody... They think, oh, okay, you're talking about Christianity. Well, I've seen what that is. I know what that's about. I don't want anything to do with it. We have to deal with people as individuals. That's part of what we see here in, in chapter 17. Paul dealt with the Jews in a specific way. He dealt with the Greeks or the Gentiles in a different way. Two completely different worldviews that we need to understand. So let me ask you real quick before we finish up. Any thoughts or questions when it comes to that kind of topic? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And when you do mission work, a lot of times the place where a lot of people start is with creation and God and the creation. Because Hinduism, Buddhism, they have no concept of a creator. Now Islam does, so it's different. In one sense, that foundation is already there, although it's a false god. Of course, Allah is a false god. But they already recognize and understand that there was a place where things were created you know, at a point in time. But today, when we talk to an evolutionist, there is a god who made all things. Now, you can get into six days if you want to, but the main point is, and what Paul's making here, there's a creator. And that's where we need to start when we talk to somebody who has a, an evolutionary worldview in our culture, in the West, whether it's America or Australia or Europe or wherever. We start with the Creator, and he's, he's the one who provides for us. He's the God who is. Not because I want Him to be, but because He is. But yeah, we start with, we start with Him. Any other thoughts or questions before we finish up? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and stop there. And then, uh, Lord willing, we'll pick it up in uh, verse 29 next week. Let's pray. Again, our Father and God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this chapter. And, Lord, there's so much here that we are just skimming the surface on. Pray, Lord, you will help us and encourage us and give us opportunities to witness. And may we pray for those opportunities, Lord, uh, and ask for the words to say and the attitude to which to say it. And to remember and remind us, Lord, that we are talking to a person or maybe a group, depending upon the context, uh, but that you would give us the words in the heart to listen, to hear, to understand, and to proclaim Christ to them. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. We praise you and pray for the service coming up and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching.